We are all human. That means there is something about our experience that is the same. Otherwise, we would not all be human. We would not even be able to communicate. Welcome back to Book Wave, the book club podcast. I'm your host, Scott, joined today by Pat. Yeah. Will. Hey. And Jason. Hey, pleasure to be here. Today we're looking at the last two rules of Jordan Peterson's Beyond Order, 12 More Rules for Life. So that's rule 11 and 12. Do not allow yourself to become resentful, deceitful, or arrogant. And rule 12, be grateful in spite of your suffering. So my first question to the group and to anybody out there listening on YouTube or Anchor or wherever you found this podcast What is the world made of? Whoever wants to jump in and however you want to take that question. Let's start with you, Pat. (laughs) Okay, here's my answer. It's a vague question to ask (laughs) because (laughs) there's so many things to go go around that question. I mean, I can ask what, I mean, I can answer, you know, the quote or maybe explore that a little bit. Um. Yeah, well, he gives you he gives you a, a few answers in the book, you know. Like, it really depends on your outlook. Like, you could answer with atoms. You could answer with story. You could answer with God. You could answer with, like, the spiritual or material. Or you could answer with, answer with potential, and they're all the correct answer. So which, yeah. which one's your favorite, Pat? Well, my favorite part about Rule 11 is just going to the origins of yourself Um, because just like the title itself in order to understand where arrogance and deceit and degeneracy comes from we have to dive deeply into ourselves first before we go on with the world and traverse it and so um and the way you do that is it's kind of like working with children in a way where you try to understand what they're seeing and getting an idea of what whatever it is that they are looking at and communicating through that. And, and the best way to do that is to present them with stories like Pinocchio because Peterson brings up Pinocchio many times. Right. And it's a way of how much it's a way of how much depth children perceive in these stories and even us adults can but the thing is they can spot things that are not very noticeable to adults they could just take a look at something specifically and then internalize it and then in a way reenact it the way they see it and it's it's almost like you know their own drama their own stage their own play and and it's a really interesting way because um last weekend i went out of town to visit my little nephew and the way he's been viewing cartoons like he's he started watching american tale you know fievel the character fievel and he's been looking at every He's been looking at very strange details, like he wanted me to rewind a certain scene over and over again, like, you know, whenever they sing or whatever. And and I kept looking at that and thinking, what is he actually looking at? And then to, to this day, I, I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. But just to go through that kind of situation, it's um, it's almost internal, too. It's... um. Just something that comes out of uh, whatever their mind is and then just presenting it through a type of medium like like movies and cartoons and things like that. So your answer well, so really... your answer is story then. <laughs> or at least like a story brings out whatever the world is made out of. Yeah. Into the into something like perceivable by the rest of us. And it's interesting you mentioned, you know, the Fifle Goes West movie because, you know, there's something out there uh, 
potential and it's kind of one of the the main songs from that movie i remember being a kid and as you're a kid you know your brain's not quite as plastic or it is more plastic so you can perceive and go with the flow a bit more and life feels more like a story and a drama and you see yourself as some kind of character in that story and um I remember being a kid and, and watching that movie uh, about Fifle Goes West. And it's kind of what they're talking about in this chapter, how there's potential, the same potential that people saw when they went west. And in that story, when you don't have a home and you know, you're know you out there confronting nature and confronting the unknown and uh, you're seeing things for what they are that you're seeing some of the good things and the bad things and the tyrannical things and even the lessons that come with it. I think I'm going to say maybe the world's made of focus or whatever the byproduct of focus is, because that's still chunked up high enough that it's semi meaningless and also enlightening. Insightful. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, if you t look at it through like atoms and other sciencey things that are the things that make the things, um, then it's like those focused specific groups of molecules and structures that become desk, become person, become planet, become, you know, something that has gravity and affects other things. And then if you zoom in deep enough to like the human level, I think, you know, if you don't know that the world is made of stories, then your focus is so into your own story that you might say, you know, the world is just made of shit. <laughs> or you might say, well, it's all love and joy and uh, divine creation in every single thing. And, you know, you get all of your array of human emotion and experience and perception through the, the name focus. I think that's what I'm going with. Well, that can tie into like what you focus on is like what, part of the world you see because Jordan Peterson brings up the 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 seven archetypes right like the two archetypes of culture the two archetypes of nature and then the two archetypes within the self so it starts with culture being like the wise king and the authoritarian tyrant that's like the the masculine element and then nature being the evil queen or the fairy godmother being the feminine, you know, element of it. And then the, the self is divided between the hero and the adversary. And then the seventh is just the dragon of chaos. So the complete unknown. So that, that's, that's another answer of what the world is made out of. And then your focus really determines your character and like the kind of world you see. And he talks about like the environmentalists and if you only see the the fairy godmother and the authorit authoritarian tyrant then you see like the masculine element oppressing the like the benevolent feminine element of nature so you really have to be able to see that there's good and evil in both sides. And I love the example that Jordan Peterson brings up when he says, you know, in Canada, half the year, you know, the, the elements are trying to kill us. Two more months of the year, the bugs are trying to kill us. So nature isn't just a fairy godmother up here. And it, you really have to pay attention to realize that. <laughs> Well, yeah, it's and, like and even in the way. cities, right? Like, if if you go into a, a big enough human hive, like we we've won the battle against nature for the most part. Like, you look at Toronto in the middle of winter; it's it's a completely different land than you know the rest of the province. <laughs> There's like yeah. five cities that maybe don't have the same experience we have, and when they get the snow, they don't even know what to do with it. Yeah, they have to call in the military some years, <laughs> and. I think if you don't know like that there are archetypes, if you don't have the understanding of options, if you don't have an open mind, if you don't have awareness of the way things could be, 
then, you know, your focus is going to keep getting more and more focused on the thing that you think to be the thing. And so if you think, you know, government is inherently evil and you focus on that and you go out of your way, you know, to make sure that you can prove to the world that this is the way it is, like your brain at an unconscious level is just going to keep zooming in deeper and deeper and finding more and more atrocious proof and evidence of what you think is the reality. And I'm not saying it is or isn't because there's a lot more to consider. Like there's a lot of bad and there's a lot of good. And that's a lot of useless in a nine to five Monday to Friday lifestyle. And you've got to be able to be in a few different gears, right? Because it's so easy to get to paycheck day and not make any impact on the world and not volunteer and not donate to charity and not engage with the bigger issues and the flip side of reality, which is like you're in society and you're not just a little worker ant. Like you have the capacity to do more. And I think that's where the resentment comes in. Just focusing on one path and that whatever it is coming from your unconsciousness, if you focus on that daily, then that's what brings out the deceit in you and begins to spread it begins it becomes like cluster clusters and everything and i think the way i think it also brings like existential dread too it not only whenever you present your ideas to the world like how it how terrible it is and everything not only are you like passing on this kind of bad rhetoric or this you know dramatic form of resentment towards other people you're also emptying yourself like you're sucking yourself dry by presenting this type of narrative to the world and maybe in the long run you might persuade a lot of people to join you and you know if if there is something to offer then you can develop a following but for the most part, it's somewhat unproductive if you do that. And it's, well, it's exactly what you said. I think the way I'm interpreting it, because it's like there's only so many hours in a day, right? Like you've got two choices. Are you going to engage in this rhetoric or that rhetoric? Are you going to do the dishes or are you going to put them off? Like, because tomorrow's coming and it's coming up real quick. And if you look back on the last 30 days and ask yourself, you know, how many times do I have a conversation where my intent was to inspire more acts of kindness and good in the world versus how many times did I have a conversation where I complained about the situation of my life and the context of the world that I am perceiving? It might be an interesting reflection. I, I just think it's interesting. Scott brought up the, you know, the vision of the world and how you perceive it. And how significant it is maybe that on the first page of this chapter there's satan who is you know the fallen angel and it's like how not to let yourself fall into resentment and and deceit and arrogance and he's kind of a poster boy for that character and i also had this quote running around my head though uh from albert einstein it's a question you know how do you perceive the universe is it friendly and mm -hmm. i think how you answer that how you approach that changes your perspective and how you you see or envision potential how you picture the story playing out in front of you because if you feel that the universe is unfriendly there's going to be a certain narrative there versus if the universe is benevolent. Well, and it's like, we've got this spectrum of perception where, you know, from unfriendly to friendly, we've got the, the victim to the almost dissociated, you know, oh, the universe is friendly and everything is perfect. And they, they just have completely put themselves not at guard. And then somewhere in the middle, you know, you've got like preppers who are like, could be either way but i got myself a shotgun right so like, like <laughs> i mean so in the drama of life you kind of ask yourself do you see yourself as this hero or adversary which i think he goes more into in the the next chapter the last rule but i like how in this rule 23 he goes into the you know the dichotomy between how you view nature 
is it friendly or unfriendly how do you view culture is it the you know um military industrial com complex or is it like a system that's you know putting order to the the chaos of nature yeah like it's easy to look at the government and say well, they're tearing us apart, but we really don't look at the other side of the coin. Like if the government wasn't there at all, would we have a reason to talk to each other at all? Would we have a reason to get along at all? Would we have any kind of connection? Cause like the guy from the next city over would be the equivalent to like another country. Right. <laughs> so it does bring some source of unity in that sense. Oh, I, I almost, the way I started to, like, I'm young. I'm, I have no idea how the world works. And I'm just starting to read these books and start to change my focus and, and widen the lens. And it's like, so we were driving into this town the other day and it's like incorporated 1909. And I was like, wait a second. If a town's incorporated, that means it's a business. What? <laughs> <laughs> and so now it's like I'm at this point where it's like, you know, you've got public business and then private business and there's this push and pull and they're both trying to sort of provide law and stability to man and sort of get like squash anarchy. And theoretically, you know, through those mechanisms, they're actually harnessing chaos and nature. And it's not so much that they're trying to make order of the nature, but it, that they're using the energy of nature, hopefully in an effective manner to sort of fuel the industry of combating anarchy and creating peace and stability in the world. And it's it's like red versus blue and public versus private and, you know, like... It's real nice to have a private boat launch, but it's real handy to move to a new town and see that there's a public boat launch. Well, it's it's kind of like what Scott said. We, we have to be able to see another side of the same coin and just see where some of the benefits are and what we can bring to our lives, essentially, instead of just being holed up with one side. Yeah, I mean, I th I'm thinking you could have a boat ramp or you could not have a boat ramp. Like, there's the potential either way, right? So I see the potential they give between the two types of nature. The characters there are the uh, evil queen and the fairy godmother. They are representative of nature. So nature could go one way or the other. Um, and then for culture, you have the, what is it, the benevolent kind king and the authoritarian. So it could go one way or the other. There's potential in either direction. And then for yourself, mm. you know, you have the hero or adversary. Uh, are you the hostile brother or are you the good guy? Right. And I think to be like fully balanced, you need both sides of all of them and a you know a healthy relationship with the dragon of chaos at the end like i don't think you get very far with only seeing culture as the wise king or the author authoritarian tyrant because like if if you think that one of them is the right answer you start turning into a conspiracy theorist or something <laughs> you lose sight of the the bigger picture as a whole you, you actually lose the ability to see, like, the good side of culture if you just focus on tearing it all down all the time and you don't even try to acknowledge the, the benefits that it gives you. You know, like the old cliche of the, the socialist, communist kid living in California tweeting about communism on his iPhone, right? <laughs> Yeah, perspective. There's a lot of stuff hidden in the fog, and I think that that's a big, uh, I don't know, variable in, in resentment and arrogance and yeah. lack of grace. Like, there is so much that we repress and delete in our existence that we take for granted, that we 
are just completely blind, like unwillfully blind to to so much of reality that it, it's so easy to slip into the blame game and say, you know what, I'm being affected by the world and I can't cause anything to happen. And so I'm going to blame this nominalization of a construct that I perceive as the source of all that is evil in my world. Yeah, and then and that like, goes no. in, that flows right into the, the third dichotomy. Like, you have to see both sides of nature, you have to see both sides of culture, and you have to see both sides of yourself. Like, yeah, sure, there's the part of you that's the hero. You can acknowledge that you're on your own path, you're taking the hero's journey, but there's also that that part of you like it is you that is the adversary it's you you're the little voice inside your head that says now nah, put it off i'll do it tomorrow i don't have to work out today i don't have to write today i don't have to you know work on my website or what whatever your passion is whatever it is you're working on you're always going to want to put it off or you know try to just do something else and that's the adversary coming through right there and it's not just that, it's it's also the, oh, this isn't a dragon. This is fine. I can do this behavior. I can do this habit. I can do this. I can do that. This isn't a dragon. This isn't a dragon. And then it, suddenly you wake up 10 years later and you're like, why am I so burnt out? <laughs> well, that little shadow that you thought was just a little kitty cat, well, that well, was actually a dragon. So you got to take care of that now. <laughs> you got burnt. Yeah. <laughs> there's there's also kind of a subtle aspect a second character behind the dragon itself because the dragon represents the complete unknown but he says that there's a treasure possibly waiting in that unknown so there's a dragon kind of guarding this treasure and if you right. are just completely afraid of the dragon and won't confront what you don't know there's no possibility of ever even looking at that treasure yeah that's just always the constant attribute of the dragon itself is it's always guarding the treasure right there there might be like always complete worth something pandemonium behind the you know the blind <laughs> corner but there could also be like a, a pot full of gold it's interesting because Jordan Peterson talks a lot about how, you know, when we're learning, we learn through stories and through narratives. And my wife was playing uh, The Legend of Zelda, The Wind Waker, uh, a week or two ago. Classic. And she got to write uh, <laughs> such a good game. Five out of five. And she gets to the island that you get from the school teacher. And the door has a person on it. He's got, like, a, a butler. And he's like, get your dirty hands off of me. You're not the owner of the place. And then you have to, like, show him the deed to the house. And he's like, oh, a deed to the house. You're the new master. I see and respect you as the master. You may enter. And it's like, looking at it now, I'm like, oh, this is a really intelligent system to, you know, convey to a child how deeds work. And as a child, I was like, well, this is weird. I better get the deed. And that was it. <laughs> but... What I was thinking about was that, you know, there's not a lot of stories and, and video games where money was personified. You know, it was always just like, okay, you enter the game, you destroy the bushes, you get the rupees because money is everything and you always need it. It's ever present and it is the way that you get stuff and you need a bigger wallet and you need to stack yeah. it up. And then in The Hobbit, there's the dragon sickness on the money. Right. Like going back to the the rupee wallets in the Legend of Zelda, I think it's a really cool game mechanic that you have to earn the bigger size wallets. You know, like you start out, you only got the junior size bank account. You can only carry ninety nine rupees. That's it. And then you have to earn the ability. You have to learn the value of a rupee. You have to learn the value of a dollar to get the bigger wallet and like you don't you don't truly understand what that money means until you know what the next shield is six thousand rupees i can only carry 999 i i, I need to upgrade here <laughs> and not to mention um same thing applies in majora's mask where you have to save the money before the moon crashes that's something you have to keep in mind too that's a that's a good parable for life, you know. Save your money before the moon crashes. 
Um, <laughs> but what I was yeah. thinking with... <laughs> no, I, I was being cynical. It wasn't a good parable for that. <laughs> with Thorin in The Hobbit, I think it's interesting because it, it isn't even a personification of the, the money. It's still not the money that's making him sick. It's the dragon that has hoarded the money, that has left its dragon's sickness on the money. And he slays the dragon, and he postures himself as though he's the one that vanquished the dragon, and it's his loot. And he did it on his own, and he turns into this tyrant for a minute. And it's like, no one slays a dragon on their own. And if you think you did, you're going to fall into a slippery slope. Yeah, maybe well, it's because like he that. didn't have maybe it's because he didn't have that incremental improvement. Like he went straight from 99 rupees straight to a billion. He didn't get the yeah. oh 999 then 9000 then you know <laughs> up and up and up until you get he just he was a lowly traveler then he was a billionaire. <laughs> Well, and boom, you've got a metaphor for fame and how it affects the psyche of someone who rises to prominence overnight. And you've got mm. a huge takeaway for people who just do not understand the effects of the dragon that is the monetary system. Take it as the thing that is the problem, blame it, call it inherently evil, and forget about the entire story and the narrations that have been developing us for thousands of years. Like, no, actually... There's a whole bigger picture here, and it's not just one thing. Right. One of the other things that is brought up is how we interact with this this reality, right? So it, he kind of Jordan kind of uh, positions that you know, we are interacting with the future through language right and in the video games like you brought up the legend of zelda you interact as a character through dialogue through scripts you get to choose what your action is going to be and what you're going to say and it kind of i'm kind of thinking that when you have lots of uh money you've gathered a large treasure your um the influence of what you have to say is greater Right. So it kind of would make sense that you want to collect this uh, money because it gives you a voice, an amplifier for what you might have to say. Well, literally, so in another video game, Maple Story, so we enter the MMORPG world, you could literally monetarily invest in your character and buy a megaphone that would blast what you had to say across every channel and on your world, right? So, like, Everybody heard what you had to say and if you spent even more money you could make it like take up screen real estate on everybody's screen unavoidably and it was a message system and it's like if you're if you're rich everyone can hear what you have to say you just have to pay for it you could do that just to say I'm rich <laughs> yeah and what ends up happening is the weirdest thing you know people just give away the the permission and they, they offer up free megaphones for people to, to say whatever they want. And what do these people do? They win the contest and they say, oh, you know, make a post that says happy birthday to my friend. And it's just like this lovely exchange. People have conversations on the world stage. They meet people and, and form bigger communities around themselves while they're on the game. But then, you know, the media <laughs> doesn't do the same thing. Oh, uh, why is yeah. that? It's they the adversary. <laughs> there are there are some there are some wholesome corners of the media, but if you if you don't even know that there's a birthday page or uh, you know letters to the editor page, like there's so many columns that existed on a newspaper that was so valuable, such a great technology that's gone now. And you know if you just have Facebook for your news, you, oof, oof. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, it's... having language as the the mode that we interact with the, the world around us is kind of significant because he goes into this whole chapter on sins of commission uh, and how telling lies, for example, if you are a rich, um, not that there's anything wrong with being rich, but if you are like a, a company owner and executive and you brag about not paying your taxes for example it's uh 
that would be kind of a sin of commission, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. But before we go there, hold on. I want to say one more thing about this whole thing about having stories and, and, and different stuff. It'd be like, imagine, you know, you've got 999 TV channels, which is like all of the different stories of what the world is made of. But you don't know that they exist. You don't have a remote. You don't have a TV guide. And you're born into Fox News. Or you're born into Treehouse, which is like a kid's TV channel up in Canada. I don't know if you guys have it down there. Or like just national public radio, you know what I mean? Like this is your one channel and you've got it for 25 years and 50 years and 75 years. And you don't even know that there's like 998 other options. Like that's that could be your world and that would be terrible. Yeah, for us it was the CBC, right, Will? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that, that kind of realization, well, it's kind of like what we were going by, what we were saying earlier, which is, you know, the, the more information we have, the more, you know, becomes overloaded and we don't know what to do with ourselves. We develop anxiety and then eventually we de develop a sense of dread. And the more we see that, the more um, this existential danger sets in. Because we don't know what to pick, but and if we do, then you know, it will just create even more anxieties and and to become to just to go just to add on what Jason mentioned um, with sense of commission, it's always going to be based on appearances, and many and there have been many charlatans throughout history that have done this, which is they want to gather a crowd around by mentioning a product or an elixir or some kind of service that they provide they don't mention it very much it's very vague but they make it very interesting and it draws in the crowd and everything and in a way you cannot blame them for that but at the same time you know they can be a bit of a you know they can be bad sometimes they can be sinful for what they do unless they know how to understand your pain and what pleasures you're after and if you can provide that to them then great but um yeah it's just based on appearances and what you can do mm -hmm. yeah there's this notion of garbage in garbage out that gets mentioned in in this chapter and I think that kind of addresses what you were talking about, Will and, and Pat, about if you're only getting a limited spectrum of the, the possible wavelengths that are out there, you're, you know, your signal's not good enough to really make an informed decision. And that's going to possibly affect, you know, your viewpoint. You might think, well, if you're only watching Fox News and getting your news off Facebook, maybe your viewpoint might be, well, the world's definitely unfriendly and there's not enough resources out there. So we should probably stop having kids altogether. And, you know, you might fall into the antinatalist. Oh, jeez. Wait, before we go to the antinatalist, I want to talk about commission and omission. Okay. Um, let's do it. Yeah, I, I, I think I got ahead of us. I think the antinatalist stuff is in the next chapter. Shh. We're talking about commission and omission right now. Um, so I think, like, and I've been thinking about this a lot, and I'm not even convinced that I'm right, but, like, I think, you know, by and large, we're, we're over the period of, like, actively engaging in crimes of commission to the degree that it's, like, happening hugely, because we don't have significant amounts of empirical wars where we're fighting to redefine the boundaries of territories. Like there's some stuff going on in Russia and the Ukraine, and there's a few areas in the Middle East that have some problems. And, you know, like there are some spots that are still like actively, you know, fighting to the death to build a town or to get the resources that their town needs or to declare the sovereignty of their nation. But like, especially in North America, like we didn't do it very well. And in fact, right now we're in an age where the media is broadcasting the crimes of commission that did develop the borders in these lands but that's sort of a lens to the past and looking and it, it it's very confusing to me that 
someone would be upset with what's been committed and not be proposing to make their own nation and in fact just want to continue to be a part of the nation that committed these tragedies and they'd like to be paid more yeah. it's i don't like again i'm a young stupid ignorant child who has no idea and needs to read a hundred more books and get an eight-year degree to to be able to have anything to say about any country that is talking about colonial history and what to do about it now i'm not I'm not the expert, but I think that, you know, barring that we're in the age of omission and we're, we're looking at companies now that aren't being sustainable and they're getting blasted. Like remember that Volkswagen documentary for the carbon emissions? Like there's a bunch of stuff happening that companies aren't doing and they're not looking at and they're hiding in the fog. Like this notion of maybe we should get to a place where we can provide natural, clean, drinkable water to everybody on the planet. Um, and not price gouge in order to do it. But like, that's a big meta industry problem of transport and purification and, and stuff like that. But it doesn't mean that we can't be looking at it. And I think that, you know, you walk out your front door in a lot of neighborhoods and you're not at a, a high rate of being raped, murdered or robbed. And, you know, obviously there's some areas where it's different, but I think post Roman empire till now, things were a lot worse. And pre-Roman Empire, things were pretty bad. I'd like to think that in the Roman Empire, uh, aside from the fringe territories that were getting invaded and taken over, like I think in, in the metropolises, crime was probably at around where we're at now again. Yeah, but they had worse plagues. I mean, COVID-19 yeah. doesn't have anything on the Antonine Plague of Marcus Aurelius's time. <laughs> Yeah, and our health is just like our health industry and our technologies have come so far that we're at a point where, you know, we're doing everything we can to get everybody to a higher excellent level of existence. And we're addressing all of this multi-headed hydra of existence and sustainability and happiness that there's so much to be missed because we're shooting at so many targets. And for as many as we're hitting, we're missing probably 10 times as many. Hmm. But I think that those rates have increased over time, historically, to the point where we can say, but we're hitting a lot more targets. Yeah. Overall, though, Will, would you say that, I guess, on a, on a cultural level, you know, between the benevolent king and the tyrant, are we still, or it was our past in kind of this um, more towards the tyrannical into the spectrum and compared to where we are now, do you see us more towards the benevolent end of the spectrum? I think it, it it's depends on the context, right? Like it depends who's telling the story too. Yeah. I think it's like the, the stronger the empire, the more they believe in the wise King element. Like, we talk about Julius Caesar like, you know, he's a dictator. He was this terrible authoritarian, but back in the day, they loved him, and that's what, you know, held their culture together. Like, Caesar was their god, basically. <laughs> so. Well, Caesar was also into acting, the drama arts, and tragic plays. So that's where he gets most of his inspiration from. Hmm. But to go back to your question, Jason, I, it's funny because, you know, I think I feel like the country feels a lot like I do. And I don't think there's any way for you to feel any other way about the world, you know, and hopefully that people can start to feel a bit better about themselves. But the way I feel at this point in my life is like there's a lot of stuff that I'm now aware of that I'm doing wrong. And there's a lot of stuff that I'm now aware of that I'm doing right. And it's terrifying thinking about just how much energy and consistency is required to maintain the structure and improve it and move forwards. And that's kind of what democracy feels like right now to me. That's kind of what the world feels like to me right now. Like there's, we have so much more awareness. We're, we probably don't even see all 999 channels yet. Like there's still mini series 
on ethnic groups and disenfranchised peoples that we don't even know that we should know. And we're now addressing and tuning in and turning up and hopefully improving everywhere we can. But there's just as many people freaking out about just as many things that it's if you get lost and you forget where all the happy stuff is, <laughs> you can shrink that lens real quick. And yeah. not to mention that there are different narratives of the same channel, too, based on whatever they're broadcasting. Right. And then there's the French channels. Jeez. The pay-per-views. Yeah, like, the exclusive I content. This, <laughs> I read this report about, you know, who translates the work sort of dictates the the new narration right and so if you know historically we've had male translators in of all of these ancient texts it's like so th there's now a telephone game and if you had a, a female translator or you know another option of translator anybody other than just white men <laughs> right. Right, for five minutes you'd get different stories and so now it's like the shows that you think you know were actually just uh, a gender swap. You thought the Ghostbusters were men in the first movie, but in fact, in the original Greek, they were men and women. And there was 12 of them. But the translator thought that wouldn't read well on the movie. Oh, the original Avengers? You mean Jason and the Argonauts? <laughs> <laughs> but we cling to our stories because that's how we make sense of the world. But we have to be able to cling to the unclingingness too. So in, in this story, he only gives us two options between the individual. You can be a hero or an adversary. But there's another idea of the t uh, the nine archetypes or the nine alignments how do you guys see that as fitting into this story at all if does it fit in true neutral doesn't exist it's just a lie but i took a quiz and it said i was true neutral congratulations you're that's, a sociopath that's because you want to be true neutral it's like the the sorting hat got put on his head and he's like, please true neutral, please true neutral, please true neutral. And then the, the quiz gave him true neutral because that's what he truly wanted. That's all. And it's like, is. guess what? <laughs> when the saber tooth tiger shows up, you're not going to be true neutral. Yeah. True neutral on paper. Like, I think they're, I think they're really good for creating a dungeons and dragons character. I don't know if they're so great for defining real people. Like, I think everybody's going to have an element of chaos and lawfulness to them. Like, unless you see yourself as, like, the pure ubermensch, then you're really not pure chaos. It really exists on a spectrum, to use an overused term. <laughs> Spectrum no, that kind of makes a great sense. Word. But it's like, oh man, Jason, I lost my thought. We were talking about a spectrum. Well, who wasn't? <laughs> well, I was just going to say that, you know, I think you are right, Scott, because <clears throat> somebody that might be described as chaotic evil or demonic, they're not like that 100% in every aspect of their way. They might have a little bit of lawful neutralness in them somewhere right well it's like so our interpretation of neutral and evil and good comes through a lens through which we've learned the world and so you can never really dissociate from your own learnings and experiences to a degree that you could even conceptualize of neutral neutral right like you hmm. aren't neutral therefore you cannot see it you know what that, that kind of reminds me of? I don't know if you guys have ever seen this, but there's an episode of Futurama where Zap Brannigan is describing all of the aliens in relation to Earth, like whether they're allies or they're enemies. He's just like, so you have, you have the bad guys, they're the bad guys. You have the good guys, and they're the good guys. But you can't. The one people I don't trust more than anybody else is the neutral, because you can never 
tell what the neutrals are really thinking and then it like cuts off to this clip of like one of the neutral aliens dying in like a, a war scene and like his buddy is like cradle cradling his like dying body and he's just saying if i die tell my wife hello and then he dies and that stuck with me for the rest of my life like ever since that point i've just been like can't trust true neutral <laughs> zap brannigan was right <laughs> Well, it's it's you, almost like you're you're waiting to choose a side when you're neutral. I feel like, and that's a problem too, because people will give you something. They will give you a side that they want, unless well, you speak like, up. Well, law is so weird, right? Like in a in a lawful society, you have the right to privacy and you have freedom of speech, and so you don't have to like so, you don't have to tell someone if you've been vaccinated or not. You uh, don't have to tell someone what happens behind closed doors if there's no noise that sounds disturbing and probably causing, you know, like you you have with law the ability to obscure um, to the degree that it is okay, according to law. And that is constantly in flux. And it's so bizarre. And it goes deeper into like the idea of having like a well, like you can go deeper into the idea of lawful versus chaotic because it's not necessarily that you're following the law of the time, like you say it will, but like you're following your own moral code kind of thing. Like I would say, I would argue that the guy from uh, Jupiter's Legacy, you know, Sheldon Sampson, the utopian, is a perfect example of lawful good because he's lawful to the max because he he prizes his law above anything else which is we don't govern we don't kill you know but it's not the law he holds himself above that law but that's still a manifestation of lawful good because he holds to a code whereas chaotic would be like you wouldn't be able to predict anything that he does because nothing has any like morals or virtues or plan behind it. He's not really aiming towards anything, just having fun in the moment, doing what's expedient, not what is meaningful. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, through that lens who would be like a, a neutral neutral a true neutral in, in jupiter's legacy not that you guys are in the loop <laughs> <laughs> um well i'd say brandon in the book is definitely chaotic i'm not I, i'd say like someone who's true neutral would have to be someone with a code that follows a code or a law but struggles with it so probably grace might be neutral good does that okay. does, does that track what about what's the other guy's name the one that i love with the eggs george George. Sky Fox. Is he Sky neutral Fox. neutral until you know reality shows up and then he has to make a choice he might be a good example of neutral neutral because pretty much everything he does is an expedient choice because he doesn't he's not forced to make that critical decision until you know he only has one egg on the table. <laughs> well, so to bring it back to the podcast, like neutral neutral is in my opinion something that you know is afforded as a luxury to to someone who doesn't have to actually face Real, reality right like when the dragon comes to your door there's you're not neutral neutral like you you're not anything until you know nature shows up and gives you an ordeal and when crisis hits you're not going to be neutral neutral it's just not going to happen it's hard to even define neutral neutral because like you either have a code or you don't so you're you're either lawful or you're not so like true neutral would have to be like you're just struggling with a code and 
to relate it back to George, I'm not sure if he really has a code at all. So he might be chaotic. He might be the perfect chaotic good character of that show. Yeah. Whereas Walter is just probably lawful evil. Or maybe maybe neutral evil or chaotic evil. It's really hard to tell. It could go both ways, I think. Because we've talked. Is there anything to... else you want to talk about of uh, Rule Eleven before we move to the last rule? Yeah. Well, I think what we're talking about, you know, kind of where you as a character, an individual, find yourself, or you might falsely identify, like myself, as a true neutral. Um, but. <laughs> this is really kind of the topic of the last rule you know why should you be good why shouldn't you just be the mephistopheles in in life well and and we're like it leads in quite well from rule 11 like it's a a whole bunch of thou shall nots that relate to you know if you if you're not doing that you should be doing grace at that point if you're not arrogant or deceitful like you should be great graceful in spite of your suffering Hmm. Yeah, it's kind of like the it's kind of like the laws of human nature in a way where you know once we understand <laughs> ourselves <laughs> laws what? of human nature oh yeah that and referencing uh. another book <laughs> but i guess it, it just if we understand ourselves and know that we're going to suffer in life then that gives us an opportunity to find something that will prepare us and give us a bit of, you know, for lack of a better word, hope down the line in our future. Figure out what we want to do and then just go for it. Right, but like the, the on the opening page, there's this photo of St. Sebastian... And I can't imagine that he had any hope other than he thought he was doing the right thing in telling the uh, kings of the time, you know, that uh, that Jesus was the savior or whatever his message was. I don't exactly know, but he got shot up by a bunch of arrows and then he didn't quite die from that. Hmm. And so he... I guess is this this image for being grateful in spite of your suffering because he suffered quite a bit and it turns out that he ends up going back to mock the same king that shot him full of arrows who then beats them beats the guy up and they dump him into like a sewer and that's kind of the end of him but uh, I mean he ultimately was doing what he thought was right right but that that doesn't mean that what he was doing was graceful, right? Like in the latter, when he returns, like, ha ha, you can't even kill me. Like that's, that's not graceful. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> I would agree with that. Yeah. True. <laughs> but it's like, it's a question of, are you actually aware of the reality? Do you accept it? And are you going to say good or are you going to say bad? Hmm. The reality it's happening right like thing happens do you want to react well or poorly do you want to be outraged at the thing or do you want to deal with the thing like there's two options and it would seem that one of those options saying that it's bad is almost like shutting down saying no i'm not accepting this reality whereas the opposite if you say yes and you're open-minded mm-hmm. to what might happen um, kind of the what Jordan's saying, he's more optimistic than he is pessimistic because ultimately he feels that being optimistic is the better of the two. Yeah, I think one, I think it boils down to one is blaming the world for everything and one is just accepting all the, you know, the baloney that comes your way. Or, or not even believing that the world is even real, right? Like, I feel as though 
Hmm. And maybe I'm making this all up, but I feel as though our generation, Jason, um, it's the question, oh, really? More than who, what, when, where, why? And it's like, you know, you say something, like I've just told you something that's going on in my life and your response is, oh, really? It's like, that's not continuing the conversation. Your shock at my delivery of news does not further this exchange of intellectual ideas and experiences. Like, how about we get more data and go from there? But instead, it's like, you, you know, you get pulled over by a cop and you go, really? Like, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, really. This is happening. You're experiencing it right now. So what are you going to do about it? Are you going to pretend that it's not happening? You're going to be shocked that it's not happening? Be miffed and thrown off? Like, just embrace the present moment be here now get more data yeah i think the oh really response is kind of a way of denying its actuality it's like a cop out like, wow amazing so cool like this isn't doing anything for me <laughs> like oh and how did that feel oh and what was it like in that and oh when was this like yeah there's there's definitely better ways to progress a conversation than oh okay cool <laughs> so, I mean, maybe so, that's kind of the neutral way of responding like they don't want to take a side they're not willing to risk anything so they'll just say oh okay really but it can't be neutral because I find it so darn negative. Maybe that's maybe that's your problem. <laughs> I think it's a sin of omission. I think it's a sin of omission. They're not uh, intentionally committing it, but they are. And they should, like, that's a sin nonetheless. And it's a blind spot. And it's a, an opportunity for growth and openness. And to realize that this, this exchange that you're having that you find pointless that's taking up 45 seconds of your life, you're doing this 40 times a day and you're going to do it every day for the rest of your life. Yeah. And the things that repeat, that's life. And as your parents always told you, like anything that's anything that you do is worth doing right. So something that you're doing 40 times a day, that's worth putting some effort in to do properly. For sure. Absolutely. <laughs> right, like it's intention setting, right? Like how many conversations do you have? where before the conversation starts, you set your intention. This is something that you learn how to do in door-to-door -door sales, something that you learn how to do in mindfulness courses. It's something that you learn how to do when you get any self-help, really. But we don't do it. We don't go into a conversation and like, okay, I'm gonna be gra great, grateful. Uh, I'm gonna go in with a point. I'm gonna have a boundary. Like there's a whole bunch of data and technology we can bring into every interaction we have and we just show up and we wing it. And we're like, how you do anything is how you do everything. And if you're winging it through your conversation and you're saying, oh, really? Like, I'd hate to see the kind of sandwich you make. <laughs> I mean that. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, in, in a way, it's kind of like what you're getting at is like acting nobly. Like you can act nobly in a, in a conversation and be engaged or you can kind of shut down and, and put up these barriers like you're saying, you know, um, quick, meaningless responses, essentially. And acting nobly is something that he addresses in this book. And he's kind of getting to the point that whatever you do however you respond it's going to have consequences so if you choose to shut down a conversation that's going to have a consequence versus the opposite is true if you you know pull the thread on a conversation see where it goes see where it leads you to yeah and you're going to find out that there's a lot of short threads in a lot of people's conversation ability like <laughs> This is, this is something we need to do culturally and globally to, to have more meaning in our lives in every interaction. Because, like, don't get me wrong. I get it. You've got your best friends if you're lucky. You know, millennials apparently only have maybe 25% of us a friend. 
Uh, but, you know, hopefully you've got like three to six people in your life that on a yearly basis you do an event with. On a quarterly basis, you see for some sort of like capitalist exchange of, of meal or beverage and conversation and catch up maybe on a weekly basis or a monthly basis. There's someone that you do things with and hopefully, you know, a couple times a month you're able to get lost in a conversation with those people. I'm not saying that you need to be my best friend, but I am saying that the average human with the te psychotechnology and the technology of literacy and Facebook, they're able to have thousands of conversations every week and they're doing a poor job. They're freaking out, they're reacting. They're shocked that people are reacting when they go on Facebook and they say something that's volatile. They don't even know what volatile things are. Like we yeah. can do better. Yeah. And I, I don't remember where I heard this. I think it was John Verveke, but there's a difference between a friend and a buddy. You know, a buddy is someone that you enjoy doing things with. A friend is someone you can connect with on a, like a real emotional level. Like it's, it's good to have buddies. You need buddies, you know, like go fishing or go play magic, the gathering or some video games for a weekend, you know, that's important, but you know, it's also important to have like meaningful actual conversations about some of the questions that you're having in life. If you're going through a crisis, it's, handy to have someone to you know lean on every once in a while and that kind of goes back to the idea of storytelling because those conversations those connections have real meaning to them they help mm -hmm. develop progress in moving the story forward well and it's like you know you hear it a lot life isn't a game you know you're not in a movie and it's like well if you were first of all it'd be a terrible movie and you'd be losing the game and you'd be like the most unimportant NPC ever. And I would never come to your shop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and worst of all, I mean, what, what do you have to offer? Yeah. Yeah. Like, well, exactly. Like if you are having a conversation, do you want the conversations in your life to be good? You are doing an action. Do you want the action to be great? Like, do you want date night to be half-assed or do you want it to be filled with motion and color? Right, but I, I do kind of feel there are some prerequisites that need to be filled in order for that person to be in the, in the kind of integrated state to have a conversation because you could be completely falling apart and the last thing you want is you know to talk about you know your life with some with a you know a, a friend or a buddy you know you have to be kind of willing to voluntarily accept and transcend your suffering you know recognizing the the person you're talking to likely is also going through their own suffering and, and that kind of helps i think facilitate uh bringing out a dialogue well and the sneaky thing, too, is like you could, you know, have a terrible, miserable, unfortunate existence and really love like specific random topic and find that community on the Internet. And you could just go and talk with some random person on Tumblr or Reddit or some other random comment thread in the Internet. Start a Discord lost. server. <laughs> and you could get lost for two hours and you'd be like, wait a second. I thought everything was terrible. This has been a great conversation. This is a great lo-fi track. Like, maybe I need more of this in my life. Yeah. I thought people were garbage, but it turns out they're just like me. <laughs> uh, I, what I think you? I, <laughs> I think I have a, a good quote to tie in from this book. And it's, uh, the human race has been dealing with loss and death forever we are the descendants of those who can manage it so you know it doesn't it doesn't matter what we're dealing with our, our ancestors have dealt with it already this like, is the chapter also where he brings up the the idea that you know if things are falling apart around you the importance of standing up and, and bearing that responsibility of maybe 
saying a few nice words at a funeral, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, there's people like chaplains that uh, I think do a lot of work behind the scenes when people are ending their life, getting to, you know, the end of their life. And um, you might not have your best friend around you, but at least there's these chaplains that they can, you know, they'll talk with you and, and they're very sincere and genuine and um, kind people. Mm-hmm. And that just goes back into, you know, acting nobly in the face of suffering. Cause like once you see the people that interact with death on a daily basis, because it's part of their career, like, the nurses that Jordan brings up or the, the chaplains and like they're around death constantly. And yet they, they don't fall apart. They don't completely break down. They're still, you know, like shining beacons of the human race. They're still good people. And it's just, there's some, there's some inspiration to be drawn from that. I think. Yeah. I think, you know, we're, every person suffers and he brings it up that we can transcend that suffering. But when he was writing this, his own wife uh, was dying of cancer, I believe. And uh, the question kind of that is subliminal in this chapter is like, why not fall into resentment and to the adversarial mind state, you know, given how, how cruel this world can feel like why should we act nobly that's uh the question that uh it felt was most prominent in this chapter and maybe in the whole book i think the trouble with saying the world is cruel is that then it feels like you live in a cruel world but it's it's a lot easier to say there has been cruel in the world I think the right response is yes, and <laughs> it's cruel, <laughs> and it's also beautiful. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. Like, as soon as you get stuck and say, look, one thing equals all truth, it's like, well, all right. Yeah, like we could go back to chapter 11. You're right. There is an authoritarian tyrant of culture, but there's also the wise king, so... You know, if you only dwell on that one aspect of culture and the one aspect of nature, you're going to have a bad time. You're going to focus on those like you're the world is made of what you focus on. Right. That's that's what we discovered at the beginning of this podcast. Well, and then the other takeaway from the great stories, right, is that there is the arc of redemption for the adversary and the right. learning there isn't like oh well adversary should become hero it's like am i in this person's story am i part of their redemption arc or is that something completely out of my control because you, if you don't know if you don't understand and have the appreciation because you can't you can't know all of these things you can't fully understand you can't say oh i know what your suffering is oh i i am you i fully understand the way you interpret reality because you don't but you have to be able to appreciate it and you have to be able to understand your own experience which is something that many of us i know my for myself i certainly don't understand the implications of my own experiences yet but it's like you have to hopefully have a deeper understanding of your own and be able to to see where you are and where your boundaries are because if you're not in the redemption arc you're wasting everybody's time and also if you're not a part of someone's story and you're in a world of confusion can you be redemptive can you find ways of redeeming yourself within the anonymous Um. world Mm mm-hmm starts by stepping out of your own cave right like the the more i think about it the more i like i really like jordan peterson's formulation of like those seven archetypes like if you're 
really just swimming in chaos, then like you need you need a little bit of the fairy godmother. I also kind of see like a like a dichotomy in like the will to power and agape like I've been hung up on lately like you guys know. Like if you take the the wise king and the authoritarian tyrant together and then you take the the fairy godmother and the evil queen together, they could both kind of represent that you know, that agopic creation in the individual and that will to power spark type creation in the individual as well so I think like a big part of the individual is just being shaped by culture and nature in that way like part parts of nature will affect you in the ways of agape and parts of it will inspire you like you know sometimes you'll see a sunrise and you'll think ah there is a god life is beautiful sometimes you'll see a sunrise or just look at the trees and be inspired to paint it or something you know what i mean i think that's the two different attributes of nature affecting the individual but it always comes down to that choice of am i going to am i going to act on it or am i just going to listen to the adversary am I going to take the path of the hero or am I just going to let the adversary stop me and go down the unrighteous path or the uninspired path even right and I think it's important to take the opportunity in, in as in every moment that you can to to take that um more benevolent path because he points out that as we age we start to become more particular in our ways and our behaviors so if you are constantly taking the wrong path when you're 60 years old what path do you think you're going to be you know way down into the dark um, forest in but if you're choosing the right path um, now it's possible you're going to choose that in the future and hopefully when you do reach that uh, future self of yours you will be on a, a better grounding a more lit a more lit path hmm. a brighter illuminated path. <laughs> i am thankful for this book I didn't find it to be a sequel of the same medium. I think that 12 more rules had a lot less than 12 more rules. Um, but it was good. There was some good story. And I think that's probably the point, right? You can Rules can only get you so far. You, you need to pontificate a bit more than just dictate. Yeah, I really like the first two chapters and the last two chapters, and there was a lot of, you know, extra Bible stuff in the middle that, you know, I could have, you know, take it or leave it kind of thing for me, but I I think it's, I think it's pretty good. After finishing it, like, when I was in caught in the middle, I was worried that I, like, wouldn't really like it as much, but at the end, I think it's, it's good. It's it belongs on the bookshelf right beside the first one here. Well, yeah, I think that's... whether or not he's gone full in on, you know, the Christian path or viewpoint, I think there is a, a significant aspect there of sacrificing some of your own self and not always thinking about yourself and kind of putting some of your energy into cultivating, um, uh, a spirit so you're not like you don't have a poverty of the spirit and thinking about your fellow man uh, that i think goes a long way if you don't want to necessarily believe in a god uh, but i think this book was quite different than the first book and um i thought it provided a lot more colorful quotes there was a lot of material in this book that uh, kind of uh, felt like a philosophical treatise 
uh, you know, why to be good, why not to be an nihilist. Uh, whereas the first yeah. book was more instructional. This one almost felt like a response to Sam Harris in in that kind of sense, like the amount of Jesus smuggling he had to do, like the, the whole moral landscape thing that that Sam Harris talks about. And that was one of Jordan Peterson's biggest problem with Sam Harris's ideology and all of his work is like, you don't define good at all except for well-being and that's not nearly good enough humans are complex okay you can't just boil it down to well-being because you know what's well-being for one is not well-being for another so you've contradicted yourself already (laughs) yeah i think for me i mean i'm i'm kind of kind of on the same side as scott um you know the the first couple of rules and the last few rules were really really good to to read i especially like um i've especially enjoyed the one where he mentions cleaning up or not clean up well make one room in your home as beautiful as possible and he brings up the ideas of the arts and everything like that that was really um like that was probably the only chapter in the book that i've meditated on the most Hmm. Um, because, you know, as an artist myself, I always look for ways to bring about uh, something that is magnificent in the most unlikely ways, or, you know, bringing a character to do something unpredictable, or describing a scene uh in different ways from different viewpoints and everything like that and um it's also been really good to explore the ideas of memory and bringing Mm -hmm. out what you have been through what you remember what you find to be a mystery what are some moments from your life that are still hidden and you're just trying to figure that out and um just bringing that through the ideas of rejection and criticism and just, you know, putting it all into practice, that can definitely transform your vision and what you see in the world. Um, And it doesn't have to be like, you know, like an epic or anything like that. It could just start off small, like, you know, like a room here or what you see throughout the window or in a way that you can see you know, kind of like in the movie Rear Rear Window, where um, James, I think it was James Stewart, the actor, is stuck okay. in a wheelchair, and all he does is just look at other people's um, apartment windows and see what their world is like. So. Yeah, it might be something as small as just saying in this very moment, you know, this is good. Life is good. It's cool to have one. (laughs) Good. Well, I think, I think we've just about covered it. So until next time. Hey, lobster. (laughs) Or equal to mass times acceleration. Boof, boof. May the force be with you. Beautiful.